So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for what is surely going to be a very thought-provoking um, presentation. It's been now um, about a year and a half since CSI had its last uh, talk in the series of uh, the future of religious minorities in the Middle East, and we haven't been idle during that uh, period of time. I'm happy to uh, report that in the meantime we've edited and Roman and Littlefield has published 19 of the uh, lectures that were given since 2013 and uh, the book is widely read and we're very happy about it. You'll find a few copies left uh, on the literature table there. Among the most insightful contributors was Professor Habib Malik. He addressed in June 2012 the issue of Syria and the Arab Spring Uprising. While Western statesmen and their media organs were still talking about Facebook rev rev uh, revolutions and transitions to democracy, Professor Malik foresaw the upsurge of anti-democratic, religiously intolerant forces that have transformed a once functioning socially pluralistic Syrian state into what American statesmen now grotesquely call a cadaver state, one that has been the scene of extensive religious cleansing on top of a host of other calamities. Today, Professor Malik addresses a broader theme, contemporary imperial actors and their impact on socio-religious pluralism in the Middle East. Professor Malik comes to us today from the American Lebanese University where he teaches history and cultural studies. These days, he is deeply engaged with editing the diary of his illustrious father, Charles Malik, best known in the West as a distinguished Lebanese statesman and a philosopher, and especially as the principal author of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the 70th anniversary of which will be celebrated on the 10th of December this year. Let us give a very warm welcome to a good friend and colleague, Professor Habib Malik. Let me begin first by thanking CSI, Christian Solidarity International, and uh, my good friend uh, John Eibner for making my appearance before you today possible. Uh, my topic is contemporary imperial actors and their impact on socio-religious pluralism in the Middle East. Um, that means um, the great powers, but it also means the principal regional actors that have also uh, exhibited imperialist uh, behavior. As a geographic and civilizational crossroad, it is nothing new to say that the Middle East has seen numerous recurring interventions by external powers since even before the sweeping invasion of Alexander the Great in the fourth century BC. Later, the Romans, the Mongols, the Crusaders, the Ottomans, and particular European states in the early modern and modern periods all engaged in imperial as well as colonizing adventures with the Middle East often being their passageway, if not their preferred objective. This history has been thoroughly documented and evaluated, albeit at times with controversial results. And of course, we have what amount to the conquests in reverse, Phoenician Mediterranean expansion culminating in the third century BC with the Carthaginian challenge to Rome, the pre-Islamic Persian and later Shiite Safavid empires, and the Islamic conquests themselves that traversed North Africa and penetrated Europe in a pincer movement, first from Spain and later from Asia Minor through the Balkans. Indeed, the spread of Abrahamic monotheism out of the Middle East to the four corners of the world itself constitutes a unique and supreme instance of cultured, cultural civilizational conquest in its own right as do the myriad implications of the eventual clash of these monotheisms and beyond, in and beyond the Middle East where they first originated. What is novel and remains timely in this context, however, 
is to undertake a reassessment of recent instances of such external interventions in the Middle East away from, hopefully, away from reductive post-colonial verdicts, including related approaches that rest on gratuitous or misplaced victimization. It is a given that imperial forays anywhere in the world are necessarily messy, self-interested, and traumatic for the peoples and cultures on the receiving end. Gr greed, oppression, and destruction are surely integral features of any imperial enterprise, and it makes no sense to romanticize the empire-building quests of the past or to gaze upon them with excessively misplaced nostalgia. But the imperial colonial landscape is far from being exclusively populated by real life characters like the avaricious mining tycoon Charles Gould and his ruthless partner Holroyd, as depicted in Joseph Conrad's novel Nostromo, or the vile and insatiable Kurtz of the African ivory trade in Conrad's other novel, Heart of Darkness. Such characters have served as archetypal targets for post-colonial hatchet jobs aimed at vilifying and condemning the entire colonial enterprise. And in the hands of someone like the late Edward Said, the severe censure extended to their creator, Conrad himself, and to other similar writers of empire. Less obvious in the cacophony of emotionally charged criticism are the numerous residual benefits for the conquered and colonized accruing from such ventures. One famous example is the robust and abiding legacy of democracy, government administration, and education bequeathed to India under British rule, something even Karl Marx acknowledged. Also, real stories of suffering and loss by specific native groups and populations tend to get trampled with habitual regularity beneath the sweep of an ideologically infused critique of colonialism that insists on fixing blame for the dark side of these tumultuous civilizational encounters exclusively on the external agents of imperialism. Thus, Armenians, along with various indigenous Christians, Baha'is, Yazidis, and Jews, to name the obvious ones, receive short shrift in the polarized histories of both the post-colonialists and their rival Western scholarly counterparts. Native majorities, especially in the Islamic world, are thereby regularly absolved of centuries of abusive domination over their fellow native minority communities, who in most instances were forcefully reduced in numbers thanks to persistent persecution by the swelling majority over long stretches of time. For better or for worse, and despite this being perhaps a somewhat embarrassing fact to contemplate for the thoroughly secularized mind in the contemporary West, it remains true that since time immemorial, ultimate identity for individuals as well as groups throughout the Middle East has been defined primarily in religious terms. Therefore, all projects that have amounted in one way or another to parachuting secularism artificially onto portions of this religiously infused Middle Eastern landscape have met with disappointment. These include Arabism, Arab nationalism, and other homegrown nationalist as well as imported socialist variants that have tried in vain throughout the 20th century to smother, swallow, or take the place of religious identities. Moreover, the Middle East religious space is far from being monochromatic, featuring instead a plethora of sects and creeds and spiritual traditions. Except for Sunni Muslims, every other religious community constitutes a numerical minority within the overall tapestry that is the Middle East. And although Islam is by far the majority religion in the speckled region, other faiths have called the Middle East their home since before the rise of Islam, and they continue to do so in the present. It makes perfect sense, therefore, when contemplating suitable and stable political arrangements for the region, to take into account this bedrock existential fact of religion being at the heart of personal perceptions and communal formulations of identity. The Ottomans, for example, and despite their many brutalities and failings, had the insight on some occasions to work 
with the given religious heterogeneity on display across parts of the domain they ruled, principally in the Levant, rather than to try by force to alter or remold it as happened tragically in the Balkans and with the Armenians. The result was the millet system of semi-autonomous native communities that thrived reasonably well in parts of the Levant between 1860 and the 1908 Young Turk uh, takeover in Istanbul. Structuring local diversity according to millets is truer to the complex realities of the region's primeval map with its overlapping ethno-religious, sectarian, and tribal components than those artificially drawn straight lines running through the desert, mainly of Sykes-Picot vintage, and that have formed the contrived borders of the states emerging after the First World War. Given this religiously mottled picture of the Middle East, how have the key external imperial actors, we'll start with them, throughout the last hundred or so years, leading up to our own time, interacted with and impacted, whether beneficially or adversely, the various sects and religious communities native to the region. The logical place to start would be with the two quintessential European imperial powers who have left lasting Middle Eastern legacies, Great Britain and France. From there, a fitting transition would consider Russia's role followed by that of the United States. And then I'll turn to the regional actors. Great Britain. Britain under Queen Victoria was the undisputed dominant naval power in the Mediterranean throughout most of the 19th century. So its acquisition in 1878 of the island of Cyprus from the Ottomans merely reinforced an already established fact. Benjamin Disraeli, British Prime Minister at the time and the one credited with engineering the takeover of the island, framed it before the House of Lords in an imperial context extending beyond the Mediterranean. I quote, in taking Cyprus, the movement is not Mediterranean, it is Indian, end quote. Keeping the sea lanes open between Britain and India, the jewel in the crown of the British Empire, end quote, was a permanent cornerstone of British imperial planning. Thus, from the start, strategy took precedence over all else in London's thinking, being intimately intertwined with maritime trade. Nearly everything Britain did in the Eastern Mediterranean was seen as bolstering the geostrategic and commercial parameters of what came to be known in British foreign and military policies as the Eastern Question how to keep the Ottoman Empire sufficiently afloat to have it serve as a barrier in the face of land-locked Russia's desire to expand southwards into the warm waters of the Mediterranean Sea. When four years later, in 1882, the British occupied Egypt, Cyprus quickly assumed a strategic backseat to the land of the pharaohs that straddled both the Mediterranean and the Red Sea controlling the crucial Suez Canal waterway. The British remained in Egypt a good 70 years, and they continue to this day to have naval bases and military facilities in Cyprus. During all this time, however, hardly any serious or sustained attention to the plight of native non-Muslim communities living under Islamic rule, the Greek Orthodox Cypriots and the Coptic Christians of Egypt, was factored into the priorities of British policies. The well-being of all components of any existing socio-religious pluralism has hardly assumed a prominent position on any British regional policy agenda. All that has mattered for London in its imperial colonial penetrations of the Middle East have been geostrategy, trade, and eventually oil. So to secure all three, the indigenous minority communities have either not figured significantly or, as in the case of the Kurds of Iraq, a Sunni ethno-linguistic minority, before the British mandate ended in 1932, their national aspirations were per perceived as a liability and hence expendable. In a sense, the same could be said of British attitudes towards the Armenians. Neither Britain nor anyone else for that matter was there for them when they most needed outside help during the dark period in the First World War as the Ottomans saw fit to conduct wholesale slaughter of their population. Worse still, 
No British government since, since has acknowledged the Armenian tragedy as a premeditated genocide because in this case, preserving good relations with a powerful and strategic Turkey have always taken precedence over any courageous expressions of moral honesty regarding the genocidal atrocities of that country's recent past. The British blind spot to the different predicaments native minority communities, especially Christians, have found themselves in has persistently infused official government assessments conducted firsthand on the ground. Observers as far back as the 19th century, Colonel Charles Henry Churchill, 1807 to 1869, British consul in Ottoman Syria that included Mount Lebanon, and later the celebrated maverick adventurer and government spy T.E. Lawrence, 1888 to 1935, both of them, uh, who, who, who of course Lawrence was spearhead, spearhead of the Arab revolt during the First World War, both of them offer indicative examples of a prevailing pattern of cold clinical narration, if not outright insensitivity. While Churchill's observations and analyses of the complex Druze-Maronite relations during the turbulent period 1840 to 1860 provide much accurate insight into the peculiar mentalities and convoluted, often bloody, interactions of each community, they leave much to be desired in terms of depth or nuance. And, one must also add, of sympathy. Churchill, in his narrative published in 1862, highlights endemic Christian divisions between Maronites and Greek Catholics, between the Maronite clergy and the leading Maronite feudal families, and he repeats oblique as well as declared associations Maronites often made with the medieval crusaders, all of which paint an unattractive portrait of the community as a whole. At the same time, he depicts the Druze generally as a formidable and cohesive fighting force whose leadership was adept at balancing ruthless efficiency in disposing with their Maronite rivals with calculated displays of restraint and even occasional benevolence. Any sense of Maronite embattlement as a beleaguered community having to face the twin scourges of Turkish deviousness and Druze hostility tends to get lost in the maze of largely negative anecdotes and recurring observations on internal Christian bickering. Towards the end of his account, however, Churchill does castigate his government for not intervening more effectively in the late 1850s to put a stop to the brewing turmoil that led to wholesale massacres of Christians in both Mount Lebanon and Damascus in 1860. Commendable, but a classic instance of too little too late. In an earlier extended account that he wrote in 1853, Churchill could not overcome his Protestant proclivities to brand all Maronite worship as hopelessly shot through with superstition. Whether it was their veneration of saints or their unsubstantiated claims of miraculous healings and the like. He states further that it was the wily Maronite clergy who used what was akin to magic and necromancy to keep the gullible people fooled and in their power. He hails the coming of American missionaries to Lebanon and their setting up of schools along with their distribution of Bibles as the needed evangelizing effort for these local and otherwise, quote, nominally Christian communities, end quote. He writes, and I quote, the ignorance and superstition that prevail in these communities and the distance to which they have departed from the spirit of true Christianity render the work of enlightening and elevating them as timely and as necessary as was the enterprise of Luther and his coadjutors in the 16th century." End quote. Having failed to convert Muslims in any significant numbers, these missionaries turned their efforts to making Protestant converts of members of the local Christian communities exploiting for this purpose both the lure of education and any lingering grievances such baited people might harbor against members of their village clergy, be they for moral or political or clannish reasons. In an uncirculated report he entitled Syria, the Raw Material, first written as notes in 1915 and later published in the Arab Bulletin, 
eventually appearing in modified form in his famous Seven Pillars of Wisdom, T.E. Lawrence, who was looking to find ways of enlisting the local disgruntled Levantine Arab population in the Arab in the uh, uh, British government's war effort against Turkish rule, reflects with notable insights on some of these communities, but never in ways that stray too far from his utilitarian purpose as a seasoned agent of his colonial masters in London. Lawrence, for example, recognizing, recognizes the potential of Beirut as a special haven for freedom and the leading catalyst for future change on the level of ideas in the Arab region. He writes, yet in Beirut, because of its geographical position and its schools of the freedom engendered by intercourse with many foreigners, there had been before the war a nucleus of people, Mohammedans, talking and writing and thinking like the doctrinaire cyclopedists who paved the way for revolution in France and whose words permeated to parts of the interior where action was in favor, end quote. It would not have required exceptional erudition on Lawrence's part to discern and openly acknowledge the real underlying reason why Beirut was different from other metropolises when it came to the crucial question of freedom, the centuries-old rooted existence of a non-Dhimmi and hence a free indigenous Christian community the Maronites principally, and any other Christians who threw their lot in with them, who did most of the creative interaction with foreigners, thereby nurturing a unique open Arab society, and who were instrumental in the inoculation of Muslims coexisting intimately with them over long periods of time with the bug of freedom. We have here, once again, an instance of that regrettable overlooking of the authentic source of what sets Lebanon's Christians radically apart from their co-religionists throughout the region. Namely, active, persistent, costly, and one should add heroic resistance to dhimmitude over centuries. Taking Churchill and Lawrence as two notable samples of official pronouncements on some of the non-Muslim communities native to the Middle East, chief among them the Christians enduring uh, near perpetual life or death perils, it becomes obvious that the East has indeed persisted for Europeans as a terra incognita. Contrary to what Churchill confidently asserts at the opening of the first volume of his three volume account of his residency in Mount Lebanon. And when one factors in the studied ambiguity of British diplomatic language as it appears in official correspondences, the mcmahon Hussein letters at the start of the First World War, for example, signed agreements, Britain and the Trucial States, Gulf Sheikhdoms, precursors of the UAE in the 19th and early 20th century, centuries, and conflicting promises through declarations, the Balfour Declaration of 1917. It emerges that intricate balancing acts aimed at pleasing everyone while not committing the British government to anything concrete often yield the opposite results. Confusion, dismay by all parties, and intractable diplomatic muddles. As George Orwell aptly expressed it in a 1946 essay, and I quote, in our time, political speech and writing are largely the defense of the indefensible. Thus, political language has to consist largely of euphemism, question begging, and sheer cloudy vagueness. One ought to recognize that the present political chaos is connected with the decay of language." End quote. Echoes of the fin de siècle Viennese satirist Karl Kraus and his biting criticisms of the debasement of language can be heard here. And Krauss, of course, connected this decline to the rise of warmongering and extremist nationalist sentiments. Nationalism, he wrote, this is Karl Krauss from Vienna, is the love which ties me to the blockheads of my country, to the insulters of my way of life, and to the, to the desecrators of my language, end quote. 
making contradictory pledges couched in expressions of abstract diplomaties in the hope that enough wiggle room will be provided for Pax Britannica to continue to reign supreme on the high seas and beyond has backfired on a number of notorious occasions, the Israeli-Palestinian face-off remaining perhaps the most distressing sore. France. Inherent to the nature of jingoism in modern times has been a callousness when it came to minorities in general and to downtrodden non-Muslim ones in particular scattered across predominantly Muslim environments. One thing tales of empire tend to do is obscure or romanticize the complexity of local ethno-religious variants because it is generally easier for the dominant outside hegemon to deal with contrived umbrella single identity fictions than to delve into the actual morass of diverse minutia on the sectarian, ethnic, and cultural levels. With geostrategy and material interests uppermost on their minds, Britain and France, the twin traditional Western imperial powers, saw fit to hammer out a secret agreement during the First World War intended to divide the territorial spoils of the crumbling Ottoman Empire, especially in the Levant, Mesopotamia, and Eastern Anatolia. This was done initially with Russian czarist acquiescence, but following the October Revolution in that country, the Bolsheviks published the agreement, causing considerable consternation among the Arab and Kurdish populations of these areas who felt they had been promised independence only to be unceremoniously betrayed. Eventually, and after introducing some modifications in 1920 to the original Anglo-French deal, the Sykes-Picot Agreement, as it came to be known, was implemented ushering in the era of foreign mandates in portions of the designated Middle Eastern region. The record seems to show that on the whole, British imperial and colonial rule tended to leave better and more durable legacies than their French counterparts as regards issues of administration, civil service, instilling a sense of the rule of law, measured encouragement of local initiatives, and the way politics was practiced. France's prolonged, bloody, and agonizing experience in Algeria between 1830 and 1962, for example, was on balance more violent and intrusive than the nearly 200 years of British rule in India. For one thing, the French introduced actual French settlers to Algeria, something the British avoided doing in India and parts of the Middle East. However, the French, for their part, placed great emphasis throughout their colonial enterprises on cultural and linguistic influences a cornerstone of their so-called mission civilisatrice, or civilizing mission, that to them defined their cultural engagement with the world beyond Europe. With the resulting francophonic states of today in sections of Africa and Asia clinging proudly to this rich cultural heritage that they acquired from France, their parent colonial overseer. Another area where French priorities outpaced British ones, was the serious and sustained attention they gave to the predicament faced constantly by non-Muslim communities native to the regions falling under French control. Paris was sensitive to how these communities struggled to preserve their individual and collective dignity, their identity, and whatever of their freedoms had still not eroded due to relentless pressures from the surrounding Islamic majority. This is perhaps starkly evident in France's intimate historic relations with Lebanon's Maronite community, a distinctive and robust Christian sect affiliated officially to the Roman Catholic Church since the year 1180 while clinging tenaciously to their rugged mountain perches, who managed over the centuries and at tremendous cost in terms of life and possessions to preserve much of their free existence surrounded as they were on all sides by a generally hostile Arab Muslim world. In 1920, and after intense Maronite lobbying in both Paris and the Vatican, the French agreed to create Grand Liban, or Greater Lebanon, that would add to the mountainous Lebanese core, the Bekaa Valley to the east, the Akkar Plain to the north, and portions of present-day South Lebanon. 
The pressing reasons justifying this territorial expansion had to do with the devastating famine recently experienced by the inhabitants of Mount Lebanon during the brutal twilight years of Ottoman rule there and throughout the First World War. Included within these newly acquired territories, however, were large Muslim populations of both Sunnis and Shiites, whose acceptance of the idea of Lebanon, whether under French mandate or later as an independent state, was dubious at best, and whose pan-Arab leanings and pan-Islamic aims would eventually clash with a Christian, specifically Maronite, sense of distinctive identity and free existence. To argue, as some scholars have done, that the French in the Levant exacerbated sectarian differences by favoring certain groups over others at a time when socioeconomic and cultural affinities existing among members of divergent religious uh, communities presumably encouraged these members to undertake collective political action, meaning to enlist in the ranks of a nascent Arab nationalism, this line of reasoning is both misleading and frankly irrelevant to the present analysis. The ideological rhetoric of Arab nationalism in its, near, in its early vocalizations, as with the likes of George Antonius and others, is completely unrelated to a discussion that attempts to assess the health of any socio-religious pluralism under various forms of external, external imperial rule. If anything, the prophets of Arab unity and Arabism, intellectuals mostly of Greek Orthodox extraction, embodied a self-hating Dhimmi disposition that sycophantically sought to placate an oppressive ma majority by vilifying everything Western while waging a war of obliteration on local distinctiveness. In fact, what eventually emerged as the forcibly homogenizing political ideology of Arabism and Arab nationalism has had the corrosive effect of diluting specific group identities, undermining native diversity, savaging the chances for authentic pluralism, ushering in repressive military dictatorships, and setting the stage after the colossal failure of this brand of nationalism for the rise towards the end of the 20th century of fanatical Islamism. In this regard, the French from the start showed themselves as the most discerning among the outside imperial powers when it came to the existing yet fragile socio-religious pluralism inherent to the Middle Eastern landscape. It is therefore distortive to say, as one scholar did in this context, that the French had a, quote, facile interpretation of the nature of Syrian society in terms of sectarian conflict, end quote and that they adhered to a superficial and self-serving notion of progress that designated the Christian minority as culturally superior, within quotes, being pitted against, quote, a large community of fanatical, narrow-minded, and intellectually underdeveloped Muslims bent on obscuring progress in all areas of Syrian life, end quote. All politics, geostrategy, pervasive secular anti-clericalism and cultural chauvinism aside, and these are features um, that are uh, prevalent in, in French history. Again, I repeat, all politics, geostrategy, pervasive secular anti-clericalism and cultural chauvinism aside, the French relations with the Maronite community in Lebanon were authentically rooted in shared values, rested on deep historical foundations, embodied a clear French recognition of the many cultural affinities they had with this indigenous community, and hence translated into various manifestations of protection over time. Sectarian conflict has been an unshakably stubborn reality in the Levant for centuries. So advancing Arab nationalism as the alleged sole unifier of peoples and societies throughout the Middle East is a glaringly erroneous marker, unsupported by the historical record in this case by actual French dealings with the Maronites. Yet this line of argument is obstinately pursued by some writers who harbor a priori anti-Christian biases. However, there was indeed an inadvertent culpability to be assigned to the two European imperial overlords, Britain and France, 
stemming from the very nature of their own political systems. Both Britain and France represented unitary versions of the liberal state. And that was the only model on offer to a patchwork region evolving slowly towards the emergence of single independent political entities. This meant that in those instances where the superficial external trappings of democratic politics were imported, and, and the instances were uh, uh, not that frequent, but the superficial importation was pervasive, political parties, representative assemblies, elections, supposed representative assemblies and, uh, and elections, hardly any underlying experience or appreciation of diversity, freedoms, and genuine interactive pluralism were part of the package. Left as such, the unitary state model was unable over time to accommodate the intrinsic communal and sectarian heterogeneity that formed a core given in places like the Levant, Iraq, and Egypt. And so instead, it lent itself quite easily after decolonization to being appropriated and refashioned into, a top -down, uh, into the top-down authoritarian states that emerged during the middle decades of the 20th century, like Nasser's Egypt and Iraq and Syria following the twin Ba'ath takeovers. The consideration the French closely paid to micro-communities under their care, such as the Maronites and other Christians in Lebanon, went some way in shielding these vulnerable groups from cert certain dissolution. The intervention in 1860 by the leading European powers, spearheaded by France, to stop the massacre of Christians in Mount Lebanon and Damascus, and to forge a political arrangement that would offer a degree of protection for them was a prominent case in point. Centuries earlier, the French had been granted trade and related concessions by the Ottoman sultans, mainly because they had stood by Istanbul in its running conflict with the Austrian Habsburgs. These concessions became the basis for the capitulations, or foreign privileges, enjoyed first by French traders and later by missionaries and educators. Out of these was born France's claim to be the protector of the local Catholic communities, principal among them, the Maronites. Russia advanced a similar claim to having as its protégés the native Orthodox subjects in Ottoman lands, both in the Levant and in the Balkans. But in Russia's case, the move concealed ulterior geostrategic motives aimed ultimately at undermining Ottoman sovereignty. For her part, Britain, lacking any sizable indigenous Protestant population to protect, eventually went for the orphaned Jews and Druze. The Crimean War of 1854 to 56, for example, started out as a tussle in Ottoman-controlled Jerusalem between rising Russian assertions to manage the uh, Christian holy places there on behalf of orthodoxy and revived French claims to do the same for the Catholic Church. Since France before Sykes-Picot, uh, but for a fleeting instance with Napoleon's 1798 aborted Egyptian adventure, essentially harbored no grand designs against the Ottoman Empire, it was not a central player in the Eastern question that set Britain mainly against Russia over access to Ottoman lands and waters. Russia. In March of 2018, Russia's special presidential representative for the Middle East and Africa, Deputy Foreign Minister Mikhail Bogdanov, who among other things is fluent in Arabic, stated that Russia is particularly sensitive to the situation of Christians in the Middle East, especially in Syria and Iraq. Quote, the tragic situation in which Middle Eastern Christians have ended up causes serious concern in Russia, end quote, he declared, while attending a conference hosted by the resuscitated Russian Imperial Orthodox Palestine Society. This voiced official Russian apprehension regarding the fate of Arab Christians has been a recurring theme among top state and church figures in Russia since before Moscow entered the Syrian arena militarily in September 2015. But its roots actually go back quite a way in history. Russia's leading non-governmental organization dealing with religious affairs in the Middle East, 
the Imperial Orthodox Palestine Society, was founded by Tsar Alexander III in 1882 as an institution to further Russian interests in the region, particularly the Holy Land, mainly through improving relations with local Christian communities, offering humanitarian aid, facilitating Orthodox pilgrimage to Jerusalem, building educational facilities, and furthering Orientalist scholarly research. It was mothballed after the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution by being essentially relegated to the Academy of Sciences of the USSR and remaining so until the end of the Soviet era, when it was revived in 1992 as an autonomous entity under the same original name. The Imperial Society, as it is known for short, is an NGO Russian style, meaning lines are somewhat blurred between it and the government, just as they always have been between the Russian Orthodox Church and the Kremlin. The formulated Russian conception of Moscow as the third Rome, a notion born after the fall of Constantinople to Ottoman conquest in 1453, was gradually refined to become an ingrained ideological component informing Russia's own self-image and destiny. In parallel to the geopolitical considerations of the Eastern questions entailing landlocked Russia's desire to achieve access to the Mediterranean, the Third Rome idea served as a motivator to liberate the captive Second Rome, Constantinople, the former capital of Byzantium, from Ottoman clutches. Russia has a long and turbulent history of confrontation with the Ottoman Empire to its south. A major turning point in Russia's favor arrived with the Ottoman defeat in 1774 in the Battle of Kuchuk Kenarji, a location in present-day northeastern Bulgaria, resulting in the humiliating treaty of, of the same name that Moscow imposed on the Ottoman Turks on July 21 of that year. In this treaty, Russia demanded and received the right to look after the interests and to protect, if need be, the Orthodox Christian populations living under Ottoman rule. These were mainly located in the Balkans, Southeast Turkey, and the Levant. Later, in both the Greek War of Independence between 1821 and 1830 and the Crimean War, 1854 to 56, meaning mainly during the reign of arch-conservative Tsar Nicholas I, Russia continued to push its bid as the prime protector of orthodoxy and the orthodox Christian peoples living in what it termed its near abroad to its south and southeast and southwest. Eventually, the Ottoman Empire collapsed for other reasons, and Russia's focus on its co-religionists to the south altered after 1917. In fact, throughout most of the 20th century, the Soviets exhibited hostility to Christians both at home and beyond, holding, for instance, Balkan Christians captive in their satellite states and undermining Arab Christians by supporting repressive regimes and leftist movements across the Middle East. A number of Levantine Orthodox Christians did go to the Soviet Union to study, with many embracing communism, and returning to undertake subversive activities back home. But on the whole, during this period, native Arab Christian communities felt abandoned when it came to any understanding of, let alone tangible support for their plight, as they found themselves effectively caught between an increasingly indifferent West and a generally unsympathetic, atheistic Russia. With the end of communism, and a religious rebirth in Russia after 1991, matters began to be reversed regarding Russian interest in the Christians of the Middle East. While concurrently, Europe has continued on its post-Christian trajectory of unresponsiveness, and US foreign policy has remained largely ob oblivious to the thorny question of Middle Eastern pluralism, despite the repeated mantras during the misnamed Arab Spring about wanting to further democracy, human rights, and basic freedoms in the region. Only France, notwithstanding its rooted secularism and anti-clericalism, and mainly for reasons of political expediency wrapped in nostalgia for bygone glories, has continued to exhibit strong and sustained concern for the safety and security of indigenous Christian communities, in particular those of Lebanon. 
Thus, both France and Russia passed through phases of disinterest when it came to non-Muslim communities in the Middle East, Russia throughout the prolonged Soviet era, and France during the brief period of rule by the Nazi-appointed Vichy government that was finally ousted from the Levant by the British in the Second World War. Russian Orthodox and Roman Catholic relations, always on shaky grounds since the great church schism of 1054 between East and West and on into modern times, found a rare space of commonality when it came to their mutual concern for the Christians of the Middle East, especially those in Syria. This shared worry was openly proclaimed in the communique that followed the unprecedented historic meeting in Havana Airport, Cuba, between Pope Francis and Patriarch Kirill on 12 February 2016. Of the 30 articles constituting the joint communique five, that is one sixth of 30, were devoted exclusively to the suffering Christians of the Middle East with particular reference to Syria. When in Russia's history, the state was not antagonistic to the Russian church, agreement often surfaced between them on the need to support co-religionists to Russia's south, facing a variety of dangers. A similar attitude prevailed on and off among European Catholics vis-a-vis -vis the Catholics of the Middle East, usually manifesting itself with tangible benevolence whenever church-state relations back home in places like Paris, Vienna, and Rome were cordial. However, coordination of any sort between Russian Orthodox and Catholic agendas on this specific issue was usually poor, if non-existent all of which renders the 2016 Havana Airport encounter between the heads of the two great churches so historically groundbreaking. If conditions surrounding certain specific instances of imperial or big power incursion into places like the Middle East can be made to impact favorably on the sagging fortunes of religious pluralism in, its, in this unstable region, then all ideologically motivated anti-imperial rhetoric much of it a throwback to the virulent leftism of last century's Cold War years, needs to be set aside in order to explore any and all possibilities of bringing fair and legitimate relief to this severely strained pluralism. In this context, the currently damaged US-Russian relations on the world stage can perhaps locate concrete common ground and chart a pragmatic course of cooperation towards the shared goal of enhancing religious freedom and anchoring socio-religious pluralism in the Middle East. With communism in Russia a thing of the past, the adversarial relation between the US and Russia has regrettably not dissipated altogether. Allegations backed by some factual evidence of Russian cyber meddling in the American 2016 presidential elections, plus sharp differences over Crimea, Ukraine, and Syria are but the most prominent hotspots defining the intense lingering rivalry between these two mighty powers. This said, the picture is more hopeful when it comes to joint coordinated action aimed at bolstering Middle Eastern pluralism. International terrorism emanating mainly from the Middle East constitutes a threat that has shaken both great powers directly and profoundly. A fact that continues to call for joint action to face and defeat it. Nurturing pluralism in the heart of the Middle East would be one effective strategy against radicalization that both Russia and the US could adopt in tandem. President Putin is on record as expressing Russia's apprehension about the Christians of the Middle East, a necessary co component for any healthy pluralism to thrive in the region. For its part, the US Department of State in July 2018 held a first ever historic ministerial gathering to support religious freedom around the world. And conditions in the Middle East received the lion's share of attention during the three-day proceedings that included representatives of over 80 countries as well as countless NGOs along with civil society experts and groups. There are indications that American evangelicals, for instance, feel ashamed that Russia seems to be beating them to the hearts and minds of Middle Eastern Christians. These same evangelicals, it has to be said, 
have over the decades shown little understanding of the traditional Middle Eastern churches and their native communities of faith. Whenever they openly embrace the platform of what has come to be termed Christian Zionism, American evangelicals invariably alienate the local rooted churches and actually put these same churches in peril if they are perceived as endorsing or cooperating with such an agenda that by its very nature lends itself to much confusion and misunderstanding and politicizing among the resident Muslim population. All of which raises the central question of where the United States, as the leading world power in the post-1945 contemporary period, has stood on the issue of socio-religious pluralism when it came to American policies as well as actions or inactions in the Middle East. So, the United States. Compared to the three European imperial powers, Britain, France, and Russia, the United States presents a distinctly different profile from the classical land-grab definition of empire that in varying ways has characterized the posture and actions of these standard imperial actors on the world stage. For starters, and surely not due to a want of opportunities, the United States resisted expanding territorially through, through the creation of colonies around parts of the globe in traditional imperial style, relying instead on the world's knowledge of its massive uh, escalating economic and military clout to, pro to project power and influence far beyond its borders. Speak softly and carry a big stick. President Theodore Roosevelt's famous dictum that a country is most effective by its sheer possession of overwhelming force capabilities, or as the renowned American naval strategist, geopolitical historian, and military theorist, Alfred Thayer Mahan put it, and I quote, force is never more operative than when it is known to exist, but is not brandished, end quote. America most of the time saw fit to just advertise its might without using it as an effective means to achieve its global goals. But there were a few decisive moments, such as America's entry and impressive performances in both world wars, when that power needed to be deployed. And the resulting victories allowed the, the United States to shape new post-war world orders without the need to set up actual colonies here and there. In the Middle Eastern context, America's political and economic footprint, its soft power, if you will, began to predominate after the Second World War, and specifically from the 1950s onward. However, its cultural influence predates that by at least a century, with the coming of American missionary groups and their establishing of schools and universities in Asia Minor and the Levant. The words of Daniel Bliss, founder in 1866 of the Syrian Protestant College, SPC, that became today's American University of, A of Beirut, AUB, encapsulate the American educational ideal on which generations of Arabs have been reared. And I quote, this college is for all conditions and classes of men without regard to color, nationality, race, or religion. A man, white, black, or yellow, Christian, Jew, Mohammedan, or heathen may enter and enjoy all the advantages of this institution for three, four, or eight years and go out believing in one God, in many gods, or in no God. But it will be impossible for anyone to continue with us long without knowing what we believe to be the truth and our reasons for that belief. Daniel Bliss, uh, founder of the American University of Beirut. Strengthening this confident sense of American openness and inclusiveness was the synergy that seemed to exist during the early decades of last century between it and Wilsonian idealism or Wilsonianism in American foreign policy. What America meant above all for the educated Arabs of that era was everything positive, uplifting, fair, and ethically upright. And they saw it manifested concretely in those Americans they actually met and with whom they interacted. This was a rare moment when America was rightly identified, consciously or unconsciously, with the promotion of authentic pluralism. Like other parts of the world, the Middle East at mid-century became an arena for the playing out 
of Cold War rivalries between America and the Soviets. Over time, America's image in the Arab world became sullied with communist-inspired accusations of imperialism just when Washington was emerging as the principal supporter of the newly founded state of Israel and the single power with the greatest access to the region's vast hydrocarbon energy resources. The global left's anti-imperial propaganda directed against the United States became pervasive in the Arab world. And Egyptian president and popular Arab nationalist Gamal Abdel Nasser rode this wave effectively. The American complicity in the 1953 British overthrow of Iran's democratically elected government led by Mohammad Mossadegh after his parliament nationalized the country's oil sector, thereby jeopardizing Britain's oil interests, inaugurated a string of American reversals against regional friends and allies that has earned for Washington the damaging reputation of unreliability. The 1979 fall of the Shah of Iran and the 2011 fall of Egypt's Hosni Mubarak are just two prominent instances in a long litany of American failures to prop up faltering regional proxies, an impression the Russians have been assiduously eager to avoid, and which explains their dogged support for clients like the ruling and blood-stained Assad family in Syria. If close friends are treated in this manner, how can the fragile native component communities constituting the region's pluralist tapestry register anywhere on the radar screen of American Mideast policies? Moreover, the fact that rarely, if ever, did the United States impress upon the regimes dependent on it for their protection, many of them authoritarian, that they ought to treat their own internal minority communities more justly let alone refrain from interfering in weak, weaker neighboring states to undermine their delicate sectarian structures signifies what can only be described as a callous disposition in Washington's foreign policy establishment with regard to the preservation of wholesome local diversity. When arguments favoring national security and economic prosperity prevail every time in American foreign policy formulations over value-laden issues of human rights and basic freedoms, despite the occasional high-sounding rhetoric to the contrary, we are surely light years removed from the idealism of the early 20th century, about which I gave some examples. Compounding the challenge to get Washington to focus more meaningfully on the benefits of sustaining pluralism in the Middle East have been decades of American dependence on Arab oil, specifically that of Saudi Arabia and the Gulf. Not only are these societies not pluralist in nature, their rulers actively suppress variety in their midst and only tolerate the presence of a subjugated migrant labor force brought in exclusively to serve the locals. All too often, American leaders have looked the other way as their oil-rich Arab allies pursued fanatical policies of propagating religious intolerance at home, in neighboring Arab states, as well, uh, or well beyond the Arab world. The spread of Wahhabism through Saudi-funded madrasas, religious schools, is a case in point. Two glaring instances of American failure to stand up for socio-religious pluralism in the Middle East came first during the protracted Lebanon War of 1975 to 1990, and then the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Lebanon in the mid-1970s saw a concerted effort led by armed Palestinians and joined by leftist Islamic groups with support from regional powers like Syria, Saudi Arabia, and Libya to topple the, st the state and destroy the Christian community in the country. Lebanon's war began as a Palestinian-Lebanese conflict that quickly took on a vicious sectarian face, plunging the small country into years of bloody turmoil. Despite its countless flaws and imperfections, Lebanon had stood out for decades as the region's unique example of functioning sectarian pluralism and coexistence with its native Christian community having been and remaining today the freest non-Muslim community by far in the entire Arab world. 
At the time, however, hardly any meaningful steps were taken by the US or the international community to put an end to this unprovoked assault on Lebanon. Instead, Syria, with its long-standing and openly advertised ambitions to devour Lebanon, was allowed, along with a fig leaf sprinkling of Arab troops, to step in as a peacekeeping force in 1976, only to become Lebanon's brutal occupier for the next 29 years. In 1982, the US briefly aligned its policy with that of Israel to install a friendly, Christian-led regime in the country, but following the assassination in September of then President-elect Bashir Jumail and the terrorist attack in 1983 on a US Marine barracks in Beirut, Washington cut and left, thereby consigning a battered Lebanon to its fate of weakened Christian political and demographic presence that resulted in a compromised pluralism. The 2003 US invasion of Iraq also a multi-ethnic and multi-sectarian society, did achieve its declared aim of overthrowing Saddam Hussein and ending his Ba'ath regime. However, in the process, there was no attention whatsoever paid by Washington to the delicate, heterogeneous makeup of Iraq, and in particular, to its ancient Christian Assyrian and Chaldean communities that, if anything, constituted the necessary ingredient for maintaining Iraqi socio-religious pluralism. Once the dust of invasion had settled, a new ominous threat reared its ugly head, ISIS, or the Islamic State Terror Organization, that inherited the remnants of Al-Qaeda and started systematically going after vulnerable minority communities, foremost among them Christians and Yazidis. For a long time, not only the US government, but churches in the West, along with the mainline media, refused to acknowledge that there were wholesale killings and destruction of villages and forced displacements and organized sexual slavery occurring on a massive scale across Iraq and parts of Syria and in Libya. ISIS has been the most lethal development degrading any semblance of socio-religious pluralism wherever its bloody terror arm could reach. And it was spawned in the wake of all the unleashed resentment and unfinished business that resulted from America's 2003 Iraq invasion. So scary has ISIS and its jihadism been for the exposed and abandoned Christian communities of Syria that the brutal Assad and his Russian backers began to assume the aura of saviors in their eyes. Actually, anyone who stands next to ISIS starts to look good. The terror attacks of 11 September 2001 in America certainly exercised minds in Washington and elsewhere around the country on the need to devise effective long-term strategies to combat and defeat this new blight. What they do not seem to have done enough of, however, is orient American policy formulations towards singling out existent existing features resistant by nature to religiously motivated violence, such as uh, any traces of thriving pluralism in predominantly Islamic contexts for special protection and creative cultivation. American reactions, for example, to calamities that befell non-Muslim minorities like the Christians of Lebanon and Iraq, not to mention what Egypt's Copts continue to endure by way of unremitting harassment have generally been slow or unhelpful or in most cases non-existent. The result of all this has been that in the era of standing up to Islamist militancy, the fragility of pluralism has deepened instead of receiving the succor it deserves. Now I come to the regional imperial actors. A quick assessment of the leading states of the Middle East itself Regional imperial actors such as Saudi Arabia, Iran, Egypt, Turkey, and Israel reveals them to be inhospitable at best to pluralism in their midst and on the whole far more abrasive towards it than the outside great powers. For the Muslim majority states in this listing that I mentioned, uh, their discomfort with regard to diversity has been conditioned from the dawn of Islam by centuries of both institutionalized and psychological vimitude inflicted systematically um, upon their non-Muslim populations. With the onset of modernity and its resulting globalization, 
It has been a turbulent and unsettling ride for these states as they have attempted half-heartedly to adjust to changing norms of acceptance of the different other. More high-profile publicity of abuses and international accountability for failures to address issues of equality and recognition. One can point, for instance, to a worrying inadequacy on the part of the certified Muslim theological luminaries and their establishments across the board, whether Sunni or Shiite, in having formulated effective, penetrating, and durable, religiously authoritative rebuttals and refutations to the naked savagery perpetrated in the name of Islam against pluralism by the likes of the violent jihadists such as Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State ISIS and the Muslim brothers and the enforcers of Wahhabism in the Saudi Kingdom or their counterpart, the apocalyptic Mahdist henchmen of the Islamic Republic of Iran. For Islam's acclaimed religious gatekeepers to simply repeat in the face of religiously motivated terror outrages that this is not real Islam or this is a distortion of Islam or which is worse but often heard, it is all a conspiracy against Islam is to betray scandalous impotence and bankruptcy at the highest levels of religious authority. Nor is hurling blame and accusations across the bow of the aggravated Sunni-Shiite regional divide the proper way to, to address pervasive abuses on both sides that boil down to crimes against diversity and pluralist richness manifested in entire living and suffering communities. Each of the regional countries mentioned above has serious issues internally with their respective others. Moreover, the tensions arising within these states from majority attitudes bolstered at times by government policies towards the minorities living in their midst are largely intrinsic and for the most part independent of any external interference by the outside great powers discussed earlier. In classic imperial fashion, these countries have systematically subjugated whole communities over long periods of time, reducing them in many instances to the status of miserable subordinates with hardly any rights or real protections. Iran has done this brutally to its Baha'i community. The Sunni inhabitants of Arabia cleansed the peninsula long ago of indigenous Christians and Jews, while the current Saudi kingdom upholds such cleansing with diligence. Egyptian society continues to exhibit hostility towards its native Coptic Christian community, numbering some 10% of the overall population in, of Egypt. A war between Turkish nationalists and the native Greek inhabitants of Western Anatolia, waged successfully by Mustafa Kemal Ataturk in the early 1920s, resulted in the peaceful population transfer out of Turkey of hundreds of thousands of Greeks after an agreement between the two warring sides was signed in 1923 in Lausanne, Switzerland, right here, thereby bringing to an end centuries of rooted Christian presence in Asia Minor going back to the days of St. Paul. Trace remnants of the Christians of Mersin in southern Turkey on the Mediterranean coast and scattered pockets of Christians in and around Istanbul are all that remain of a once thriving Anatolian Christianity. And Turkey's bloody feud with the Kurds everywhere is an old and sordid story. As for Israel, its Zionist project to establish a Jewish homeland has produced spectacular, spectacular results for its Jewish inhabitants, but has yielded far less by way of dignity and political fulfillment for its non-Jewish residents. While it is a fact that minority communities in Israel are treated better on the whole than their counterparts in other Middle Eastern states, religious freedoms are largely observed, citizenship rights are protected under the law, and political representation does exist for native Arabs in the country's legislative assembly, the lingering sense of grievance by Palestinians tarnishes an otherwise exceptional experiment. Regional pluralism has experienced severe eclipse in modern times. During the 20th century, decades of Cold War confrontation, uh, the Arabs on the whole 
regimes, intellectuals, and masses opted in favor of the ideologies of authoritarian socialism and fascism instead of gravitating towards liberal democracy. This is a failure of the Arab intellectuals of the middle decades of last century. This spawned, for example, the twin, uh, though rival, Ba'ath regimes that ruled both Iraq and Syria with iron fists. It was a fateful orientation, the result of sustained leftist brainwashing that painted the West, specifically the United States, as imperialist, exploitationary, and unfriendly to native peoples of the region. The West's exaggerated imperialist stain in Arab eyes helped bolster the tyrannical regimes that sprouted in their midst, facilitated Marxist penetration of the region, also charging in on the horse of Palestinian victimhood, and eventually helped precipitate the Islamist backlash that is still with us today. When this Islamist challenge to existing rep repressive regimes reared its head, neither the intellectuals nor the peoples of the Arab region were prepared to embrace what would have constituted the preferred alternative to both secular and religious oppression, namely democracy, freedoms, liberal politics, and human rights. Consequently, their spring turned sour and chaos ensued. Just to let you know, I'm on page 28, and I'll finish on page 32. Um, <coughs> it is fine and in many cases even legitimate to cast the West as predatory and imperialist. But these peoples and their rulers throughout the Arab, Turkish, and Iranian worlds need to remember that they too have a share in the culpability of oppression and waste. The energy riches of the region, for instance, which have largely been squandered in unproduc unproductive directions by the local and regional custodians as far as the welfare of their peoples and societies are concerned, would have never come to light to begin with were it not for this very same West. Left on their own, the natives of Arabia and Persia had no idea what hydrocarbon wealth lay hidden beneath the sands under their feet. They did not possess, nor did they invent, the technical means by which to detect and then extract these hydrocarbons. And they did not and still do not manufacture any of the machines, industries, or technologies that use these hydrocarbons. The West has done all of this. One should add here that if excessive use of hydrocarbons has undermined the climate and brought, an envir uh, brought on environmental pollution, which it has, it is the West that holds the scientific means to create viable alternatives for clean and safe energy. And even if this West in classic imperial style stood to reap the lion's share of benefits and profits, the natives have little justification to enjoy whatever they receive of the consequent bonanza and then throw stones in the very well that has given them prosperity or the real potential towards it because their leaders squandered most of it. When attention turns to the health of pluralism in a place like the Middle East, it is obvious that stock must be taken of how the many native non-Muslim communities in the region, chief among them the Christians, have been faring. The most central ingredient for a vigorous and diverse pluralism, my friends, is freedom, both personal and group. A cursory grim glimpse reveals that the vast majority of non-Muslim communities indigenous to the region and the overwhelming majority of the Christians among these live under mounting pressures when it comes to their individual or collective freedoms. It is tendentious propaganda to maintain that the great powers in the world, or the West in particular, are exclusively or even primarily responsible for this deplorable state of affairs. The overriding source for this sustained assault on freedoms in the Middle East is internal, domestic, local, native, and homegrown. It is bound part and parcel with deeply rooted attitudes embedded in Islamic societies that are generally unaccepting of the different other in their midst. Setting aside the highly misleading and romanticized depictions of Islamic tolerance peddled by a host of mainly English and French historians since the 19th century, the Muslim category of dimitude 
or deliberate reduction of entire communities to subjugate its second class status is not a formula for tolerance with a view to eventual acceptance. Instead, my friends, it is a recipe for premeditated and relentless liquidation. It is high time Islam as a belief system owns up to its share of historical responsibility in perpetrating this uncompromising dehumanization of non-Muslims through the mitute. For an anatomy of the dhimmi type shows that over time several demeaning stratagems for survival have had to be devised by individuals and entire communities alike merely in order to, to remain alive. A cultivated inauthenticity penetrating to the intimate realm of identity. An esotericism truly foreign to the Christian spirit that is called upon to shout it from the rooftops. And the sad spectacle of truncated self-fulfillment. Crippling awareness of a constant hounding external peril and much more. That's the dhimmi type. A certain kind of alienation from true identity. For their part, the outside big powers, through their past and ongoing imperial intrusions into the Middle East, do indeed bear responsibility for not appreciating sufficiently the fragility of indigenous socio-religious pluralism. As mentioned earlier, unitary states like France and Britain did not at any point in time promote viable federal or confederal arrangements for the motley socio-religious tapestry that is the Middle East. And the United States, itself a federal nation, has not sought to apply the benefits and advantages of that system to the beleaguered communities of non-Muslims who consider the Middle East their home. Federalism as such is no panacea for the countless ills of a place like the Middle East. Still, by way of bold and creative federalism, much can be devised to help relieve the plight of these communities and save Middle Eastern pluralism. But difficulties abound. If you are a native Muslim, nearly anything these foreign imperial powers do could appear menacing and supportive of subdued or suspect minorities. And if you are a non-Muslim, the regional imperial actors invariably assume a threatening and unfriendly posture. So the complicating factor of divergent perspectives comes into play here. But even this cannot obscure the underlying truth of an unacceptable situation like that of lingering limitude. With regard to social, economic, and political issues, the, re the leading regional states of the Middle East have subsisted on the narrative that the foreign imperial powers have been the principal culprits deserving of blame for all the region's miseries. But as soon as the focus turns to socio-religious pluralism with its ailing communal heterogeneity, the tables suddenly become reversed and a still elusive reckoning besmirches these very same states to this day independently of any external influences or interference. The now deceased novelist V.S. Naipaul, both in the, born in the Caribbean, uh, but with origins hailing from the Indian subcontinent, toured a number of non-Arab Islamic nations and recorded his observations in revealing details in at least two books. The picture that emerges in these works is not flattering to Islam. And for this reason, he has been severely maligned by the pillars of what amounts to a post-colonial version of political correctness in historical scholarship. Few these days dare to quote Naipaul. And so a great deal of the biting truths he perceptively and courageously unmasked have gone unpublicized and unappreciated. This is precisely why Naipaul will now be quoted right here. Islam is in its origins an Arab religion. Everyone not an Arab who is a Muslim is a convert. Islam is not simply a matter of conscience or private belief. It makes imperial demands. A convert's world view alters. His holy places are in Arab lands. His sacred language is Arabic. His idea of history alters. He rejects his own. He becomes, whether he likes it or not, a part of the Arab story. The convert has to turn away from everything that is his. 
the disturbance for societies is immense and even after a thousand years can remain unresolved. The turning away has to be done again and again. People develop fantasies about who and what they are. And in the Islam of converted countries, there is an element of neurosis and nihilism. These countries can be easily set on the boil. This is V.S. Naipaul. Naipaul here is pointing to an inconvenient reality. Islam's deliberate and uncompromising severing of history and the labeling of everything that came before Islam as an age of ignorance or jahiliyyah to be discarded by the convert. This creates an eternal enmity between any convert to Islam and his or her original identity, with all the attendant pathology stemming from such an existential trauma. It is hard to imagine a more extreme example of identity-altering imperialism than this Arab version. But indulging too deeply in a train of thinking along these lines will surely bring down on one the crushing twin stigmas of Islamophobia and Arab hatred. All of Naipaul's novels are saturated with similarly penetrating observations, and for this reason, he has become the bete noir of the liberal left. It is precisely this pseudo-liberal left contingent in the West that waxes most hypocritical when it clamors for the recognition of every conceivable, even bizarre, conception of identity sprouting in their midst, while simultaneously turning a blind eye to the existing, ancient, rooted, and struggling diversity of non-Muslim communities within the wider Islamic world. Indeed, most of the time, these hypocrites, when they deign to pay attention, side openly with the oppressors of these besieged communities. Similarly, for the post-colonial sacred cow of respect for other ways of life that always comes to a screeching halt at the outskirts of the Islamic world. There is the twisted post-colonial, there in the twisted post-colonial mind, it is the very perpetrators of abuse themselves that are uh, accorded the status of eternal victims who should be shielded at all costs from criticism uh, of their centuries-old institutionalized and dehumanizing assault on any smattering of authentic pluralism. Naipaul has severe impatience with this post-colonial moaning and whining and misplaced victimization. He is one of the few with the courage and eloquence to say so, and to point out that in many respects, things were decidedly better when foreign Western rule was in charge in these depressing societies. Sadly for Middle Eastern socio-religious pluralism, neither the post-colonial school of permanent and misdirected victimization, nor its opposing and respectable orientalist rival that has offered us an array of serious scholarly histories by leading researchers such as the late Bernard Lewis, have undertaken any in-depth and worthwhile investigations into the dreadful state of this neglected aspect of the region's history and sociology namely pluralism. If one takes the entire corpus of historical output by Lewis, and it's probably this much, the category as well as the consequences of dhimmitude, namely the root affliction besetting resident non-Muslim communities, in particular the Christians, receive in total no more than 15 to 20 pages of coverage out of tens of thousands of pages. Of course, he does have a lot to say about what he calls the Jews of Islam, and he has been a pioneer in uh, uh, chronicling that history. But the other groups, um, hardly anything. The issue always comes down to how much scholarly justice has or has not been done to Islam and to Arab Muslims, or reductively since Edward Said to Palestinians. And hardly ever, whether such justice in historical scholarship has been done to the spectrum of non-Muslim communities buckling under the strains of centuries of the mitude. Thus, Middle Eastern socio-religious pluralism continues to reside in the blind spot, the no-wind invisible zone, between these two contending approaches and outlooks, the authentic Orientalist scholarship and the post-colonial um, uh, ideology. 
a disquieting omen when projecting into the future. Given this bleak picture, it is miraculous that any pluralism has managed to survive in the Middle East at all. Thank you very much.